Um, it's really great to, um, to see everybody again uh, this month. Thanks for, um, for joining us and for your support, which is really greatly appreciated. Um, just going to uh, see if I can rem remember to stop my video so you don't have to watch me. You can see the slides instead. <laughs> Right, well, the, the impetus for this month's talk was the three wonderful donations received earlier this year, which connect the three Victorian men of this talk with Kelmscott House. The first donation came from Natalia Martinenko-Hunt. Um, she's the Honorary Secretary of the William Morris Society. And she came across this fabulous signature of George MacDonald on the retreat headed writing paper. George MacDonald was a Scottish author, poet and Christian minister. And his home, the retreat, was renamed by William Morris and is now better known as Kelmscott House, headquarters of the William Morris Society. We'll learn more about MacDonald and his fascinating years living at the retreat in the talk. The second two donations were generously donated just weeks later by Frank Sharp, an author on numerous articles about Morris and his circle. They are photographs of MacDonald and John Ruskin. And I think it's an amazing coincidence that we receive these two donations within weeks of each other and that they have this lovely connection with MacDonald. And also prior to these items being added to our collection, we didn't actually have any original objects relating to George MacDonald at all, which was a great shame as he's the second most famous man to have lived at Kelmscott House after Morris himself. Both photographs were taken by the famous Victorian photographers, Elliot and Fry, whose company survived for a century from 1863. I imagine many of you will know the connections between Ruskin and Morris, which we will look at briefly later in the talk. But there are also fascinating links between Ruskin and MacDonald, which we'll also explore. When I decided to focus this talk on these three new acquisitions to our collection, I began thinking how I could connect MacDonald and Ruskin in a short 20 minute talk. The link of the retreat, or Kelmscott House, seemed to be a fascinating history to highlight, which also loved, like connects Morris, of course, to the two men. So I'll begin by explaining, explaining a little of MacDonald's life, as he may not be familiar name to everybody, and we'll then look at his relationship to Ruskin in connection with the retreat, which then brings in Morris, who bought the lease of the retreat from George MacDonald. So there's quite a lot of history to fit into our coffee break this morning. So the autumn of 1867 brought George MacDonald, poet, minister and novelist, to Kelmscott House, then called The Retreat, along with his wife and their large family. MacDonald was a pioneering figure of modern fantasy literature and even regarded as the founding father of the genre. The Victorians became enthralled with classic fairy tales and MacDonald's stories sold in huge numbers. He was a major literary influence on many notable writers, including J.M. Barry, Elizabeth Yates, the sister of W.B. Yates, who attended Morris's socialist lectures at Kelmscott House, Mark Twain, L. Frank Baum, author of The Wizard of Oz, G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, Edith Nesbitt, J.R.R. Tolkien, and Lewis Carroll. And although no longer a household name like Morris, it has been argued that he was a bet better known to the general reading public in his own time than Morris and made a huge impact on those literary figures. In fact, C.S. Lewis wrote that he regarded MacDonald as his master, while Chesterton referred to him as one of the three or four greatest men of the 19th century. And he cited The Princess and the Goblin, a book written while MacDonald was living at the retreat, as a book that had made a difference to my whole existence. However, MacDonald is best known as a literary mentor to Lewis Carroll. And here he is photographed here by Carroll with his eldest daughter, Lily, who was friends with Kate and Ellen Terry, the actresses. 
it was actually through George MacDonald's advice and his children's enthusiasm for the story that encouraged Carol to publish Alice's Adventures Underground, later renamed Alice in Wonderland. At the time, the manuscript was approximately half the size we know it today, and it was MacDonald who encouraged Carol to lengthen it. In fact, Greville MacDonald, the first of the children to become friends with Carol, declared that there should be 60,000 volumes of it. And here he is photographed by Carol. Lewis Carroll, one of the finest Victorian photographers, created photographic portraits of all of the MacDonald children. And here we have Carol himself photographed with Louisa MacDonald and four of her children. And I wanted to include this because it's such a sweet photograph. This is Irene MacDonald, again photographed by Carol, who gave the picture the title, It Won't Come Smooth. And hopefully you can make out she's, try, she's going to try brushing her hair with her mirror in her hand. It's been suggested that the photograph was to illustrate his poem, Those Horrid Hurdy Gurdies, which goes, My mother bid me bind my hair and not go about such a figure. It's a bother, of course, but what do I care? I shall do as I like when I'm bigger. And as well as friendships with some of the greatest writers of the 19th century, the McDonald's were also in the centre of artistic circles. And the artist to have the most impact on MacDonald was Arthur Hughes. Hughes met MacDonald in 1859, introduced by the sculptor Alexandra Munro. But it was in the year that MacDonald moved into the retreat that the collaboration between author and illustrator began. Their working relationship was both successful and productive resulting in Hughes producing over 200 illustrations for several of MacDonald's children's stories, including this one here. Another interesting connection with the Hughes family is that one of MacDonald's daughters, Mary, was engaged to the artist Edward Robert Hughes until her early death in 1878. Edward Robert Hughes was the nephew of Arthur Hughes and his most famous works are Night with Her Train of Stars, and Midsummer Eve, which have been um, reproduced countless times as greetings cards. MacDonald wrote two of his best loved works during his occupation of his Riverside home. At the back of the North Wind that we have here in 1871 and The Princess and the Goblin a year later. But the finest collaboration between MacDonald and Hughes was the former at the back of the North Wind, considered to be one of MacDonald's masterpieces it has particular associations with the retreat as the book is actually located at the house, particularly the coach house adjoining the building. The story involves a young boy named Diamond who is befriended by the North Wind and carried along on many adventures. His bedroom is located in the loft above the coach house. We also know that the coach house was used for a time as a stable for the MacDonald's horse and their two Shetland ponies. And those of you who have visited Kelmscott House will be familiar with the adjoining coach house, where Morris would go on to house his Hammersmith carpet workshops and later have his socialist meetings. In Hughes's illustrations to the back of the North Wind, he creates a fairy world in which heroes and heroines attain their goals through noble acts and adventures. And this, in this world, good always triumphs over evil. MacDonald also attempted to dispel the boundaries between the classes by using his characters to show it was the quality of the individual and their actions, not their social status, that determined their worth. MacDonald commented, I write not for children, but for the childlike, whether they be five or 75. And here we have the North Wind as a beautiful woman with lovely pre-Raphaelite hair. And there's Diamond, the little boy, the hero of the story. And here they are again. Hughes had a great ability in creating a dream world and his charming illustrations for MacDonald's book highlight his affinity for young people. Hughes was prolific in his illustrating and became a major figure in Victorian book illustrations. 
Their new home was a great success with MacDonald and his family. And here you can see um, Upper Mal on the left, uh, number 26 of this picture with the adjoining coach house to the very far left. In fact, um, MacDonald and his large family consisting of his wife and their 11 children <laughs> found it um, being the family so large that they had to actually take the small adjoining house, River Villa, in 1875. That's the number 24 to the right. This offered a dual purpose of providing increased room for the McDonald's large family and also enabling their great friends, Anne and Jane Cobden, the daughters of the Liberal MP Richard Cobden, to stay as extended house guests. Some of you may be familiar with Jane Cobden. She later became Jane Cobden Sanderson when she married Thomas James Cobden Sanderson, bookbinder at the nearby Dubs Bindery, and later co-founder with Emery Walker of the Dubs Press. The bindery was to the right, um, named after the Dubs pub, which you can see in this illustration. The Cobdens also give an additional link between the McDonald's and the Morrises. Jane Cobden was Lillia McDonald's greatest friend and the Cobden Sandersons were close friends of the Morrises, particularly Jane, who traveled with them to Italy in 1881. There are no surviving photographs of the interior of the retreat from the McDonald's time. So instead, we look at those from Morris's occupation taken by Emery Walker. The decoration of McDonald's study, which is um, the long room on the first floor of the building, was to become Morris's drawing room, as we see here, but it was said by Rossetti to be fearful to the eye, whereas Greville MacDonald described the rooms as being an adorned in a sort of barbaric splendour, with crimson flock wallpaper, with black fleur-de-lis stenciled over a dark blue ceiling, with scattered stars in silver and gold, and a silver crescent moon. So we'll have to use our imagination to see what it to imagine what that would have looked like. But William de Morgan was also far from impressed with the decoration, writing that he found the red flock wallpaper in extremely bad taste and noted how the ceiling of azure blue dotted with gilt stars was considerably tarnished. And Morris said of this room in MacDonald's time, the drawing room is, since MacDonald knocked a bedroom into it, a great long room facing the river. He went on to say, it could easily be done up at a cost of money and might be made very beautiful with a touch of my art. The long drawing room could be made one of the prettiest in London. And as we see here in Morris's time, it was. And that cost of money he referred to actually saw Morris to spend a thousand pound in redecorating the whole house, a huge amount of money when he moved in in 1878. The McDonald's were great entertainers. Plays were often performed at the house. A removable stage was erected on the lawn and the coach house was converted into a theatre complete with gaslit stage. The scenery was painted by E.R. Hughes, who we heard of earlier. And annual entertainments were given for Octavia Hill, founder of the National Trust, with numbers reaching almost 100 on occasion. Other visitors included many other prominent Victorians, such as the poet laureate Tennyson, who had to be rescued on boat race day from being swept up with the crowds on his way, and Samuel Barnett, founder of Toynbee Hall, Edward Byrne Jones, and as we've already heard, Arthur Hughes and Lewis Carroll. Another frequent visitor to the retreat was John Ruskin. Ruskin was one of the most esteemed artists, social commentators and art critics of his generation, still very highly regarded today. And it, it was his scepticism regarding the machinery and working class situation of the, of the industrial age that really united MacDonald with him. MacDonald was brought up during the middle of the Industrial Revolution and saw the devastating effects it had on both rural areas and those who lived there. Both Ruskin and MacDonald began their careers writing fairy tales as well. Written when he was just 22, The King of the Golden River was a reworking of various grim tales and was written for the young Effie Gray, whom Ruskin would eventually marry. The friendship between MacDonald and Ruskin led George and 
um, led George and Louisa MacDonald to serve as a go-between in Ruskin's long romance with Rose Latouche, much of which occurred at the retreat. MacDonald was also entrusted by the Latouches to oversee Rose's welfare during their absence, and they acted as their closest friend and advisor. Ruskin had first become Rose's private art tutor, and he said he felt there was something exceptional about her. This is his sensitive and charming drawing of the young Rose. Ruskin's interest in Rose grew into fascination and their interaction consisted of extraordinary amounts of correspondence. And although Rose was 33 years younger than Ruskin, most who knew Ruskin, including the McDonald's, thought his motives were pure and his love honest. However, Rose's parents were distrustful of Ruskin, mainly because of his atheism during the time of the proposed engagement to their daughter, and also because of his annulled former marriage to Effie Gray. The McDonald's tried to sue the relationship between Ruskin and the Latouche family, but even when Rose became of age and could marry Ruskin at her own consent, she refu they refused because of their religious differences. The whole sad situation had a profound influence on both of them. And in 1875, at just 27 years of age, Rose died in a nursing home. Various authors describe her death as arising from either madness, anorexia, a broken heart, religious mania or hysteria or a combination of these. But whatever the cause, her death was tragic and it's generally credited with causing the onset of bouts of insanity in Ruskin as shortly after Rose's death, Ruskin began to take part in seances endeavoring to contact Rose's spirit. And one of these clairvoyants was described by MacDonald and led to Ruskin's disturbing apparitions, which lasted for several years. Greville MacDonald referred to this period in Ruskin's life as a breakdown, but looking back to, to um, July 1872, it's hoped that Ruskin gained some solace from what he described as his three days of heaven spent with Rose at the retreat. Sadly, the McDonald's became gradually convinced that their Riverside home was to be blamed for the family's poor health. Three of the children later were to die from TB. Um, interesting as an aside, the family then went on to move for a short time to Great Tangley Manor in Surrey, which later Morris was to decorate as a coincidence. And they then moved to Bordigaria in Italy, where MacDonald founded a literary studio, which soon became one of the most renowned cultural centres of the period, well attended by British and Italian travellers, including Jane Morris. An interesting another connection with MacDonald and the Morrises is that Jane actually took part in one of the theatrical entertainments. She wrote to Wilfred Scarwin Blunt, I have been taking part in some tableau vivants at George MacDonald's and people seemed pleased. Tomorrow, I am to be chief lover, as I am so much taller than everybody else. But going back to the reasons for McDonald's leaving the, the retreat, it was the, really the house's close proximity to what Greville called the foggy river and evil smelling black mud at low tide. Felt The family felt it made increasingly doubtful that the environment was wholesome and they were constantly to travel later in life in search of cleaner air. So it was for this reason that in 1877, the McDonald's decided to leave the retreat and put the lease up for sale. And it was Dante Gable Rossetti, who house hunting for himself, first came across the retreat. But his main objections to taking the property for himself centered on what he described as the frightful kitchen and the belief that the house was liable to flooding. Around this time, Morris was also looking to move from Horrington House in nearby Turnham Green. But unlike Mo Rossetti, Morris immediately saw the house's potential. We are fortunate to have several detailed descriptions of the house by Morris because Jane was on holiday in Italy at the time. He wrote to her, if you could be content to live no nearer London than that, I cannot help thinking that we should do very well there. 
and certainly the open river and the garden at the back are a great advantage. The house itself is just about big enough for us and the rooms are mostly pretty. By this period of house hunting, Morris had become aware of the difficulty in finding a house near the centre of London for a reasonable rent. Complaining of prices in Knightsbridge and Kensington being around £300 a year. Morris was eager to take the lease and tried his best to allay Jane's fears, brought about by Rossetti and the Miss Cobdens. But Jane's objections to the house really centred on the distance, on living so far from central London. In a further attempt at persuasion, Morris suggests that they purchase a pony and trap to alleviate the problem of distance, but that never materialised. However, his strategy worked, and on the 4th of April 1878, Morris arranged to take the lease from George MacDonald for £85 a year, a low rent that reflected the need for extensive repairs and redecoration, which we've heard was to cost Morris £1,000. Therefore, as Jane Cobden Sanderson so aptly put it, the days of Christian socialism came to an end at Hammersmith to be succeeded in the same house by the more strenuous days of Marxian socialism. Morris believed that their friends would visit often, if only for the sake of the garden and river. And it was also nearer to their great friends, friends the Byrne Joneses at the Grange in Fulham. Morris added affectionately to his letter to Jane. So let us hope we shall all grow younger there, my dear. And here we have the boat race in 1892. You might just be able to make out the very brave people standing on the rooftops of Kelmscott House, which is the, the large house in the centre of the photograph. Um, we've heard about the boat race in McDonald's time. It continues just with those, all those crowds of people um, on the uh, overlooking the, the size of the walls, looking over the road race exactly today. Or so, perhaps maybe not, not this year, but uh, usually it's like this. Morris immediately renamed it Kelmscott House in order to link it by name to Kelmscott Manor in Oxfordshire, which Morris had rented since 1871. The two houses were already connected by the Thames, and Morris was to undertake two boat journeys between the two Kelmscots in the next few years. He had also expressed an early dislike for the original title, The Retreat, which he felt was uncomfortably similar to the then common name for an asylum. In less than a year, Morris established looms in the coach house where the beautiful Hammersmith carpets were created. This is one of the most historically important rooms in the house because of the carpets and because it was later converted into the meeting hall of the Hammersmith Socialists. And just to bring in Ruskin again now to link with Morris, Morris had long been aware of Ruskin's teachings and like MacDonald, the three men shared similar views on art and society. In fact, Morris's political views were very much inspired by Ruskin and he went as far as to say that Ruskin was my master. Morris is said to have put Ruskin's ideas into practice when he became an active socialist, going on to establish his own branch of the um, Hammersmith League, which had meek, meekly, weekly meetings in this room. And Morris held a particularly high regard for Ruskin's The Stones of Venice, which examines Venetian and Gothic architecture. Within the book is a chapter focusing on Ruskin's beloved Gothic architecture, the nature of Gothic, which Morris felt was one of the very few necessary and inevitable utterances of the century. It was whilst living at Kelmscott House that Morris established the Kelmscott Press, his own private printing press, just a few doors away. The press printed this beautiful edition of the nature of Gothic. This is a society's copy, which is currently featuring in our new online exhibition curated by Mallory. So please do have a look on our website for this beautiful exhibition. There are many detailed descriptions of Kelmscott House, as well as Walker's atmospheric photographs of the interior, but there's really insufficient time to cover that in any detail this morning. However, several descriptions are reminiscent of MacDonald's and Morris's fantasy writing 
and perhaps the, the magical atmosphere of their riverside home inspired both writers in their literary field, as, as it's remarkable that both men wrote fantasy novels whilst living at Kelmscott House. And like MacDonald, Morris is also credited as inspiring C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. The enchanting feel of the house was commented on by many visitors. An interviewer from the Pall Mall Gazette recalled, as soon as you open the front door, you are in another world. Others said it was like entering a land of fairies and of being in an enchanted interior. George Bernard Shaw certainly agreed with these comments, saying it was a magical house. I'd like to end by thanking Natalia and Frank for their kindness and generosity in donating these wonderful objects to the society. They've made a huge difference to our collection and enable us to tell the important stories behind these two fascinating men, particularly in relation to Morris and Kelmscott House, the Hammersmith home, which meant so much to the three men. And it brings to mind what Morris wrote whilst living at Kelmscott House. If I were asked to say what is at once the most important production of art and the thing most to be longed for, I should answer a beautiful house. Well, thank you very much for listening. Well, thanks so much, Helen. That was fantastic. I agree. It's wonderful to have these pieces in our collection and really thank you so much for sharing them with us and giving such rich context. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. If, if you do have one, I ask that you please um, type it into the chat and I'll read it out for Helen. Oh, we are, I think we've already got one. <laughs> Yes, this is specifically about Kelmscott House, Helen. Do we know um, when it was built and for by whom? We unfortunately know we don't know the name of the architect. And also, when I did my research um, in the Hammersmith and Fulham um, Records Centre and Archive Centre, there wasn't even an exact date. Um, we we could only get as near um, as the um, I think it was late seventeen eighties. Um, I'm just mm. going to double check because I've got, if anybody's interested in finding out more about the house, I shouldn't, this is a bit of a plug yeah. for the society's um, bookshop, but we have a, a <laughs> book um, about the history of Kelmscott House um, that's available to buy on the website. Um, but, and all it said is um, 1790s. Um, and, yeah. and actually it's quite a surprising choice for Morris. Uh, because he said how much he disliked Georgian architecture, but it happened to be very convenient where it was located, the rent was cheaper, beautiful riverside location, but it was actually very different in those days to how it is now. Um, lots of industry, um, um, dirty river Thames, um, and it was far, far cry from how it looks today. Oh goodness. You mentioned earlier about the, the risk of flooding, which of course being so close to the Thames is a concern. Do we know if it ever got flooded when Morris was living? It, it there? did. Yes, it did get flooded. Oh. And actually, <laughs> the when I mentioned that the looms uh, for the Hammersmith carpets were, were hand woven mm. and sort of hand knotted in the coach house, which you can just about see to the left of this picture, mm -hmm. um, the one of the carpets had to be rescued from the from oh, the flood. No. Um, and they had to take it out into the garden uh, to be rescued. There were no descriptions of the damage of the of the flooding, but I can only imagine what devastation it was to cause downstairs, because those of you who have visited Kelmscott House will know that the society has its office in the basement um, of the of the building. So you go to the left of the house and enter down some steps to get there. So if you enter the water entered the um, the coach house, I can only dread to imagine what the uh, the basement would have, <laughs> how, it, how that would have fared, um, <laughs> since then obviously we've got the, the, the Thames barrier and so on, but uh, it's always a little bit of a concern being just so close uh, to the river, and of course that was when Rossetti was house hunting, he thought about taking the lease of the retreat, but that was one of his main concerns, he felt the house mm. was liable to flooding, and he was, uh, he was very right, as Morris was to find out. <laughs> oh dear, oh definitely. 
And you as well mentioned um, Lewis Carroll, um, and then as well that he was perhaps in, inspired by Morris. Are we aware of any direct connections between the two? Carol and Morris? Um, not, not so much um, Carol and Morris. Um, mm -hmm. The most, the, the great connections with Matt Donald um, and Carol. Mm -hmm. um, there's not, I haven't really been able to find anything about Morris so much though. He, he went off, obviously Morris went on to inspire many other writers um, like um, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis have been made, named uh, of two of the main ones, uh, but not, yeah, I'm not so sure. Um, about Carol so much and, and Morris, mm. just and mainly MacDonald, I'd say. No, not so. Those were such fantastic <laughs> photographs um, that uh, of Carol and the MacDonald family. They were they were lovely. I haven't seen those ones before. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, I think those are our questions. Um, Helen, would you like to tell us about the next uh, Coffee with the Curator section? Session. Yes, rather. Yeah, thanks, Valerie. So, so next month, we're actually bringing it forward slightly by a week. Um, instead of being on the third Tuesday of the month, it's actually going to be on the second Tuesday of the month, which is Tuesday the 8th of June. And the reason for that is because we're linking in with Open Garden Day, which uh, happens on the 12th. So we wanted to, our event to happen before that so we can um, mention the, the talk then. Um, and that talk on the 8th of June is going to be about William Morris and his gardens. So it's all going to be linking with open gardens. Um, so we're going to hear about um, the gardens at Kelmscott House, the Kelmscott Manor, Red House, and so really the houses that Morris lived in. We're going to be hearing more about the gardens, the plants and flowers he had there, his descriptions of them, and to see some beautiful illustrations and photographs um, of those lovely gardens. Oh, looking forward to that. And as with this one, you'll be able to book for that on our website. Um, and just to note, as, as you mentioned, Helen, with uh, London Open Gardens, this year it is going to be entirely online. Um, so do check out their website. They're going to be doing a fair bit of content. And we're doing this um, uh, to, to coincide with, uh, with their events program. So thank you for joining us, everyone. A tremendous thank you again to you, Helen, for such an interesting session. Um, a reminder that um, if you came in a little bit late or you'd like to, to see this again, or indeed our previous sessions, they will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, wishing you all a great remainder of the afternoon. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>